as you know, no doubt, the Colossian church was exposed to a myriad number of heresies and attacks and misguided doctrine. And if I keep repeating this, it's important. Why? Because people sometimes read this book and they only think if they believe it is an actual factual historical document, they'll say, oh, that was back then in 60, 70, before 70 AD, 60 something AD, doesn't apply to us. But see, right there, right off the bat, you're wrong. The vast majority of churches today have already engaged in misguided doctrine, whether it's the doctrine of raising money, or the doctrine of give to get, or the doctrine of you'll be blessed, keep getting blessed, God's the, God's the bestower of bling. I mean, I can keep going. There's, there's so many different heretical things that have already crept into the church, and the message that seems to be always covered up or people move away from, the good news, the gospel, Jesus Christ. He died for me, he died for you, that he might forgive our sins, that we might have life eternal and life more abundantly. Those messages are being kind of covered up to appease people who come into the church wanting social justice messages. And listen, I'm here to only talk about this subject. You can, there are other hours in the day for that. We gather to glorify, to understand, to get a better sense of what this book is saying to us. So one of the first things that I can tell you, because I said I would start talking about this, it is very clear when we start into beginning at the 15th verse of Colossians, it's very clear that we are dealing with people who had infiltrated the church and their teaching basically lessened Christ to a lower rank, possibly on par with the angels, even lower perhaps. And now humankind, we're created supposedly to be the highest point in creation. <clears throat> I scratched my head. 1 Corinthians eleven seven says that man is the image and glory of God. <clears throat> I have to clear my throat on that one. <clears throat> and Christ is the firstborn of all creation, but not, he is not created. And when we talk about this word that we looked at last week, which is the Greek word prototokos, it means the first of his kind. I tapped into words that we know, like primogenitor, from the Old Testament. If you were born as the eldest or firstborn, you got the sense that you basically inherited a double portion. There were blessings that went along with that firstborn title. We're not necessarily talking about Christ as firstborn that way because he was not created. He was always. In fact, if you read in verse 17, makes clear he is before all things and by, all, by him all things exist. When we dissect that, you'll see it makes it abundantly clear that he always was. And the confusion sometimes I think people get into is because they're not reading the verses that I'm going to highlight, there's confusion about who in the Godhead did what. So if we want to back up these concepts of God is Christ here being referenced, let me read the verse first. Verse 16 says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. All things were created by him and for him. Now that seems pretty straightforward, but see if you combine it with who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him, this is where people started to think in reading this text erroneously that Christ had a beginning, that he was born, that he was created. Now, don't get confused the concept that some people do, which is separating out. I cannot tell you in detail, and I, I, I don't even want to attempt to try and define the Trinity. But as the Father has his work, the Son has his, and the Holy Spirit, it's that person's work, and I say that person's because the Holy Spirit in the Greek is neutral, not man or woman. That's how he can 
that person, the third person of the Godhead, can take up residence in us. If it was masculine, I'd be talking to you like this. <laughs> All right. So, 1 Corinthians 8, 6 says, There is but one God the Father of whom we are of all things, and we are in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Or elsewhere, Ephesians 3, 9, to make all see what is the fellowship, really the economy of the mystery from which the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Christ Jesus. So there's two things we can know from that Greek word we looked at last week, which is in your King James firstborn, the Greek word is prototokos. The first thing we can know is that he preceded the whole creation. The second thing is that he is sovereign over all creation. And I started thinking about the concept. Remember when I was explaining about prototokos, how it is essentially Jesus is the first of his kind. When we read firstborn, we ought to not think of natural birth necessarily, but that which basically is the first of its kind for which the rest of the family will follow. So in this case, it would be safe to say if the son is identified with the family, which the Bible says he is the head, the whole of creation which eagerly awaits redemption is following after his kind. So when we say firstborn, we're not talking about natural births. We are talking about spiritual, in the realm of spiritual things. So that's first and foremost. Now, I want to step over here, and I'm only going to start with one word, so please, people, don't freak out. This one word right here, hoti. And why do I, shouldn't be a dot there, why do I highlight that first? Because again, here we go into the Greek to show you some specifics. So, let's take this. We'll put this piece of paper over here, and I'll see if I can stand backwards and not fall off the edge. I tried to kind of copy what I've put on the board for you, so hati, and then I put the Strong's concordance number. So every single word that appears in our Bible is also in a concordance. Number 3754, that, because, since. And if you read down, I've used a little bit of just bullet points, the substance or contents of a statement used at the beginning of a sentence, much like English has quotation marks, except You'll see even from the Sinaiticus, there's no quotation marks. So when it appears at the beginning of a sentence, it can act as quotation marks for the rest of the sentence to say, hey, pay attention, something's being said. In elliptical formulas, which is more of a grammatical thing, the reason why anything is said to be or to be done, because, since, that, and then added to a speaker's words to show what ground he or she gives for his or her opinions. So... What's interesting here is that here, chati is used as the first word of the verse that assigns the reason or justifies what was previously stated about Christ as firstborn. This is, I'm giving you very complicated Greek in a very simplified way. Greek is about word order, so the first word in your sentence is going to be important. This one takes you back. It doesn't make you go forward immediately. It forces you to go backwards and look at what came before. It's almost now going to exemplify, justify, expound on why. So the first thing I want you to look at as I showed you this this word, hoti, is the fact that it brings you back to verse 15. Verse 15, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature or of creation, for by him. So you can see that the thought, the writer's thought, the Apostle Paul's thought, is connected in one fell swoop. This is important because we don't have punctuation in the Greek. And now starts something very interesting in terms of the grammar. So let's do a quick translation here, and I'm just going to try and write so that it's still legible. Help us, God help us. Okay, because, could be because or since, in him, in autu, ektiste, that would be were created, tapanta, all things, in, in tois, in the tois, uranois, 
heavens and chi epi upon or on this guess the earth ta orata we'll call it the the scene it's important to say this the the visible the scene might be easier to do it this way and remember this in greek when you have an a at the beginning what does it do it puts it in reverse so the scene and we want to not just say unseen but non-seen we would in english say invisible but let's put not seen not visible weather thrones weather eight weather kuriotetes lordship lordship weather eight archai which is rulers weather authorities thor did i do that right authorities if i didn't it's okay tapanta all things dia auto through through him you'll see why i'm doing this in a minute kai and to or unto to or unto out on him right down to the bottom have been have been created now so as to not scare anybody here who's like oh it's all greek to me there's three things in here today i want to focus on in him that's number 1 number 2 will be through him and the last one will be to or unto him okay so if you're looking at this and you're overwhelmed don't be these are the three things i'm going to focus on primarily and we'll see if we can stay the course here so as i explained that first word in your first order throws you back to go back to verse 15 And then we approach a threefold statement of fact from our text. One that Christ is the basis for creation. I'm going to elaborate on this though because that's just a very generic saying in him. Christ is the instrument of creation through him and when we talk about this to him the end result or the purpose of creation that is something that goes back to him not for us these are things we 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 begin to see in more modern societies where everything starts to be about me and not about him but he created for himself he created for his good pleasure if we can remind ourselves of that it might knock us down a couple of notches to quit being so glib about what he has done and what he continues to do for us Now, remember I said English is English. I want you to take a look at something. Just these three words because in him. Okay? Because in him. And it might not seem very far when I read other English. I just wrote down a few here. For by him, in him, for everything, because by him. and i even went so far as to look at some of the other languages i have german here italian and latin in fact the latin actually for once does something correct coniam in ipso condita and just in the word in or in the italian which is from the same latin stream poiché in lui sono stati in that word in so not every translation will have this word this little preposition in Now bear with me because there's going to be people out there who are not grammarians and they'll say well you're engaging in semantics and it's little petty things well here's the deal it's not semantics because if you understand your english language you recognize that even 
when we use prepositions in English, and I actually took the liberty for some of us who may be slightly limited, even in English, prepositions can represent time. They can represent position and direction. I mean, there's, it's not just, I think sometimes people use terms without understanding there is depth that you can, even in English, with its limitations, achieve. So what happens to a preposition when you now approach the Greek language? That's where it gets fun. So bear with me for a minute. I'm going to do something that some of you are going to find extremely painful. I guarantee it will only hurt your brain for about five minutes, okay? So I'd like you to take a look at this first... I'll take this away. I'd like you to take a look at this first drawing that I've done. And these are Greek prepositions. And somebody looking at this says, I don't know what the hell that circle is. But let me explain. So first and foremost, I took the most popular prepositions in Greek, and I've given you a kind of diagram, which some of you have seen before. I'll do it a little bit in a different way in a second. But if we were looking at our, our preposition, actually, I didn't put it in, but it should be right there. In fact, it's right here. So let me put that over that, right there. So our preposition that begins that second word over from the beginning of the sentence in the Greek, in, is in the dative case. And if you look at the next word that's circled on my board, which is di or dia, it's in the genitive case. And if you look at the last group that I've circled, it's in the accusative. Now, somebody might say, what the heck does that mean? It means a lot. First and foremost, let's talk a little bit to familiarize folks listening who have no clue of what I'm talking about to make it understandable. I actually find Greek grammar much easier than English, believe it or not. So you have, we actually had case system in our English language, but the Greek functions by it. Some scholars say it has five cases, some say it has eight. I'm of the mindset that because Greek is the, uh, flows from the same stream as Sanskrit, and Sanskrit has eight cases, I use eight cases. That being said, if we were just going to put it down to the simplified, what does all this mean? You've got dative, the dative case. I always say this picture, that circle I just drew for you, that's, that was on that piece of paper, picture that there's a circle around me. I'm standing in that circle. I'm inside the circle. That's dative, all right? If I step outside the circle, I'm outside the circle now, and I'm pointing at the circle, that's accusative. And if I've moved all the way through the circle, that's genitive. Now, what does that mean in real time? In the circle, dative, something that's happening inside me, but it can function, the preposition can function in 10 different ways, all right? Sometimes the dative will help us to determine, don't, don't go, oh, it's grammar day today, the direct or indirect object, rather, of the sentence. If we were using the nominative case in Greek, that says, remember, I nominate myself, subject, right? I'm nominating myself as the, as the subject of the sentence. But these have movement. So I'm going to try and explain how this helps us, first and foremost, by giving you something better to look at, which let's put this, let's replace these and put this down here. So you see I've circled my three prepositions. What is this going to do for translation? Well, the first thing it's going to tell me, without a question, without a doubt, is that the preposition in has a local meaning, and I'm going to try and explain what that means. So if I go back to that concept that I just did, you ever say to somebody, what's going on inside your head? Hmm? We could say that inside your head is the date of case. There's something going on in there, right? Now, what if I take an idea and I now carry it forth? And I bring it, I had an idea. I'm standing in my circle, okay? I'm in the dative case. 
in my mind, I have an idea. Now I bring the idea to fruition. The idea may be of Melissa's mind. Therefore, it's genitive. It belongs to me. I thought of it. I'm now standing outside the circle. And if somebody said, that's Melissa's idea, they're using the accusative to identify. They're pointing the finger. I've tried to give you these hints to make it clear. So I want you to take a look at something. And I'll, I'm going to reiterate this again, because once you put it together, it makes perfect sense. In him were created all things. You might think, off the top of your mind, that sounds very simple. He created all things. But what if I start putting down the seeds this way? Before there was creation, there had to be the thought. So we know like the verb, the uh, verse in Philippians 2 that says, let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, right? There had to be the mind thinking. Now, whether this thought process emanated with the Father or the Son for this conversation is irrelevant. What is relevant is the fact that a thought was conceived to create. And from that thought, let's call that thought the blueprint to create. Now, from the blueprint, you hire an architect, and the architect takes what's in the blueprints and begins to build. Hence, we have Jesus. Hebrews 12 says he's the author and finisher of faith. The Greek is related to architect. He's the architect of our faith. And he's also referred to as the master builder. So when we talk about in him were created all things, I want you to think not just of the sense of he spoke and all things became out of nothing, but I want you to think that there was a blueprint first. There was a plan. This wasn't done willy-nilly, Alan Dershowitz, you know, let's just, it's an accident. He's going to start over again. He'll keep starting over again. No but rather the blueprint in his mind then then requires, if you will, taking the plans, the blueprint, and with an architect's help, building up to realize. And so when you look at creation, you can't just think of it as one act. It was premeditated. It was thought out in him. Now, if you move to the next one, and you'll see why I use this example of building. Through him, which is in the genitive, which means it came out of him. Genitive is possessive. Mm, your Bible, or we put an S, apostrophe S to, in English to denote genitive. Here, we're using a genitive case, which means something that emanated out of him. It proceeded out of him. Now, if, if creating... The blueprint was in his mind, and if it came through him as the agent, we immediately deduce one thing and kick it out and don't talk about it again. He could not have been created if he's the creator. And if all things came out of him, then he could not be created. I'm trying to dance around something to basically deal with putting to bed heretical ideas of how to interpret this text. Lastly, if you take a look to him, which basically is in the accusative, which is saying, if you want to put it this way, I did all this. I made the blueprint. I brought it to fruition. That's the genitive, making it come to pass out of him, but for a purpose. The purpose was for himself. He did all this design, thought, acted and put into play, if you will, for himself. So it is impossible when we start talking about who Christ is, because these verses, whether you know it or not, maybe some of you are, haven't been studying the Bible that long, some of you have been studying it forever. Whether you know it or not, this is the deepest Christological explanation, probably only second to Hebrews, the opening chapter of Hebrews, and maybe one or two other verses in the Bible. So it's imperative to give this the proper attention. Um, And why do I say all this? Because if I say, 
this verse tells me unequivocally that he created. It, it came out of him, it came through him and out of him. That dispenses with the idea that he could ever be anything but from eternity. And many scriptures, by the way, back this up. Now listen, if you don't believe in the Bible, people say, well, that doesn't prove anything. But if you're reading the Bible and you're going to study the Bible, then confirm the Bible with the Bible. Don't confirm it with my words, confirm it with the Bible. You've got repeatedly things like, for example, from the book of Revelation, where he says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. You want to take these concepts, the thought was in me, I am the beginning of the thought, and I am also the end of the thought. I did it for me. I am Alpha and Omega, first and last, from the book of Revelation, is one way to define. Another way is if you read when he says out of John's gospel, before Abraham was, I am, speaking of his eternal position in the Godhead. So if anybody says created, I want you to be certain. We've, we're looking at this to kind of dispel any of that and be certain we understand who did the creating. You see, if you go through Scripture, you can find a lot of different passages that then it becomes more clear. For example, even a passage out of Ephesians 2 and 10, which says, we are God's, what? Workmanship, right? Which we know the Greek is poem, poema, uh, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which, were, which God prepared in advance for us. In other words, God did all of this in creation, all of this preparing, but for a purpose, not just because. See, in today's age, we just have this because, and that's all we need to know. No, he did it for a purpose. So when you start recognizing he created for a purpose, it wasn't willy-nilly, it should start making scales for some fall off the eyes that you are part of the creation. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof and all that dwell therein. You know that passage out of both Corinthians and Psalms? It should make something concrete in your heart that if he put all of this attention, thought first, the carrying out, and for a purpose, that your life and mine have included in it his purpose. Now, I believe this might be the forgotten message. You know, a couple of weeks ago I was talking about God's will. I believe this might be the forgotten message of Christendom. God has a purpose. You know, that's always tossed around when people are in trouble or you're hurting. Go, God has a purpose for you. You know, just talk to him and, you know, God's, God's got a plan and a purpose. But the reality is, if so planned out, premeditated, and then out of himself he brought forth, it means you and I are no accidents. We fit into his plan. He called you. He chose you preveniently before you even knew him to be a part of his plan. Even some of you listening to, to me today, they're like, oh, this is too much over my head. There's a reason why you're tuned in. I, I may just say one thing you walk away with and maybe you never tune in again. That will be in your mind. It'll be a bugger in your mind for a long time. And I know a lot of people get hung up on this. For example, people that are confused about the father and the son. And maybe we'll attempt to get into that. But right now, my point is, everything that was created was by design and had a purpose. So if you read, for example, Psalm 19.1 that says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showeth forth his handiwork, even the heavens preach his glory. But you know what? You can walk out every day outside your house, look up, and you may only see blue sky and a couple of clouds. That's all you may see. You may not actually look up and say, this is what he did. Now, this is controversial because in this day and age, especially for our young people who are being fed, that, you know, you, if you would like to say that you evolved from an amoeba cell or from a monkey, knock yourself out. You know, you either started in a, a little mass, a little pool of gunk, or you came from a monkey. I'm, I'm sorry. I think if God had the mind in the details, when I think of birds that can fly in the manner that they do, in every detail in creation, sorry to tell you, I don't think he just sent, you know, I'm going to take a shortcut. I'm just going to dump this little log over here and see what comes out of it. 
and presto, the creation came about, right? I don't think it happened that way. If you want to go to the New Testament, Romans 11.36 says, For of him and through him, sounds very similar to this, and to him are all things to him be glory forever. Amen. So I want you to see another thing in here that I want to highlight. Because uh, twice here in our text, Tapanta, there's one. There should be another one right here, Tapanta. And there's a third one that occurs, I believe, in verse 17. It is uh, verse 17, and then you've got another one there, in, um, which is italics in verse 18. But the emphasis, at least three times, thrice repeated, all things. That should let you know, if somebody like the Apostle Paul, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, is emphasizing all things, it means all things. It's inclusive, all-inclusive, all things. And he goes on to say the visible and the invisible. Don't, don't stop there for a minute and think, well, that means, means the things I can see and the things I can't see. But if you keep reading in the text, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, powers. Now, these words that we have looked at in other passages specifically principalities and powers. Those are two words that we find in Ephesians 6 when it says we wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities, powers, archos, exousias. These are words that are commonly associated with angelic, fallen, or demonic beings. So take a look at what he's saying if you think about it. When he says all things, he's talking about Seen and unseen, you and me, unseen can be atoms, quarks, neutrinos, uh, down to wind, which we cannot see. Things that are invisible. Don't just think of, I'm imagining. But if you think about it, thrones, curiotetes, lordship, it seems to me, archai and exousiae, the only one, by the way, that's singular is quite interesting, is thrones. It's not thrones, it's throne. And plural lordship and plural rulers and plural authorities tells you something. People came to Colossae, and not only did they reduce Christ's rank to a lesser and under the angels, but also elevated angels, both good and and bad. Now, angelology is a practice kind of among a lot of, not all Jewish people, but some, and even within the Christian realm, there are people that worship angels. And this is what Paul will caution against when he says in the worship of angels and things of of such sort. But there's a reason why this is all spelt out like this. See, when error starts to creep in somewhere, people are very easily And it's very clear that the people at Colossae started to look to other people when confusion or heresy crept in. They started to look elsewhere to find their information. They were no no longer looking. There there wasn't a Bible, per se, like we have. There was an Old Testament, Septuagint, Greek version, perhaps. There wasn't... These letters were being written. So there was no New Testament, per se. And what you end up with is people coming into the church and now infiltrating so that the gospel that was once preached, that focused everything on Christ, your salvation, your redemption, reconciliation, everything focused there, it's almost as a distraction now. Oh, well, you can look in other places to find wisdom, which brought about Gnosticism and Gnostic heresies. And equally, if you really think about it, and it's still going on today, that's why I said to you, don't read this as an old letter Read this as a template for something that's still going on today. Heresies still creep into the church. People are still looking for other wisdom elsewhere, okay? Even Christian people. Now, I'm not saying don't think and don't read. I encourage, I'm the first person to encourage reading and studying and deeply at that. What I'm not encouraging is exactly what happened at Colossae and happens in many churches. I don't care what your, your denomination is. 
a little interest that takes a side road that detours away from the things that we as ministers, pastors, anyone who stands in a pulpit, whatever your faith walk is, to divert from the gospel and to preach something else. Like, you know, almost a little bit like self-help. We'll have Jesus and something else plus. Now, either Jesus is all in all, in all things, through all things, by all things, for you and in you, or he's not. There's nothing in between. My gripe and my grievance is a lot of people don't understand when you start into a text like this, you realize it's loaded with information that you can actually walk away with, even though that's all Greek. My guess is you're going to walk away with an even clearer understanding. If anybody came to you today and said, after church or this week, and said, Christ was created, you could come back to this text through what I've done to just show you by prepositions alone in the Greek, the impossibility of that. That's number one. Number two, if I keep going through the scriptures, old and new, I find over and over and over again the concept of creation, that in creation, that the creation praises him, that the creation actually was designed for that. And we are coming into this house of worship, and for some, I'd have to say, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to praise. We are part of the creation. And yet, because we don't consider ourselves as part of that, a lot of times we're not even close to praising him like the scriptures describe all of creation, that last psalm in the Psalter that says, let everything that hath breath praise him, right? Well, I don't know how you could understand that. Maybe when I hear the birds sing, they might be praising him. We can't understand them. I don't know. But I know that the creation of humankind spends more time grieving and complaining than praising. Now, I'm going to say it's interesting. If you turn to the second chapter, there's kind of an explanation for all this. Second chapter, he's writing to people who have never seen him in person. That's what the first verse says. But then in verse 2 and 3, he says that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all the riches of the full assurance of understanding. And that I stop there on. The riches of the full assurance of understanding. That's what this message is about, understanding. And you might say to me, well, I can glean that from the English pretty good, but the depth that I'm speaking of and the absolute unequivocal mitigating or canceling out of heresy is also what I'm emphasizing as well. So when we talk about this full assurance of understanding, that's why I do what I do. There's a lot of people who come into church, churches, and if you start talking about the Trinity, what each we'll call it office of the triune God does. People are confused. They don't know. Oh, they'll make statements about it. Just generic. I don't really need to know anything. I don't really need to probe. I don't really need to understand. No, you're wrong. We all need to understand deeper. The more you dig in this book, the more you dig into the source material, something happens. If you want to call it greater understanding where your eyes are open, greater conviction, greater growth, and a greater care once you come to an understanding about something of how to treat the text. But let me keep reading when he says, full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now, interesting, just read the next verse. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. That's pretty much what happens in a lot of places today. Instead of telling people how it is. And, you know, maybe people do criticize and say, you know, you're, you're just too coarse. We want, we want to listen to someone who's got smooth words, who makes us feel good. But I'm an educator. I'm not here to give you a spiritual massage. I'm here to educate. So if you think about it, any man could beguile, or any person could beguile another if they didn't really know 
You know, it's, it's kind of like this. Our culture, think about movies and TV. Our culture tells us something, for example, about something maybe about law enforcement. And we watch something on TV, and our culture then dictates that that's how it is. And let's talk about a sitcom or a reality show or whatever it is. And we start believing that that's the way things actually work, when in reality, ask someone who actually does that professional, say, what are you, nuts? Lest any man beguile you. That's what I'm talking about in the scriptures. But see, we don't make the same leap to this. We just think, no, oh, we read it, and somebody will interpret it for us who actually cares. Now, I'm not interpreting my opinion. I'm interpreting the language. And that's where I'm trying to show you the importance of studying. Not every message has to be this detailed, but the importance here is to dig and to understand why. When we talk about God creating, you are no accident. I am no accident. There is a purpose. There was a purpose in his creating, of course, which was marred by first Adam and Eve. And then, of course, in our letter itself, it's going to talk about reconciliation, how he reconciled everything by giving his life, laying down his life and going to Calvary and dying on the cross. He reconciled the world back to him, his blood paying the price so that we may be again connected. One, as John 17, the high priestly prayer that John prays, Jesus prays in John's gospel, that they may be one like I and the Father are one. That's the desire of creation, unity within the body of Christ. The other thing that he's emphasizing in this verse is the cosmic powers that he's naming. And I, whether they be good or bad, four classes perhaps of beings, I, I'm not going to get too hung up on this. But what is important here is you notice the Apostle Paul doesn't put anything in his letters that's frill or fluff. So when he says all things were created, he's equally saying that if we take these as four offices, whether they be fallen or not fallen, angelic beings, these two were created. That confirms what the Bible says. Angels were and are created beings. So even there, if we're not sure, there is confirmation. So what do I want to leave you with? There's, there's, there's a reason for doing all this. What do I want to leave you with? And here's what I... I'll go back to using my three prepositions. And so when we talk about in him and the creation, I'm not looking simply at what I see, but the fact that there was a thought before and when the word, the Logos of John's, John 1, when the Logos spoke and when the Logos declared, it wasn't just an opening of the mouth to speak all things into existence. There was the thought before there was the speech, and then the speech became realized. All of these going through him for a purpose, and that if we're very clear... The all things that were created, by the way, this being a something in the past, and awkwardly, both of these ver verbs for create are in the passive, which is a divine passive. The Greek interpreted it that way. We could say all things were created in him. Go back to my circle and think about Genesis 1-1 in the circle. Let us, and whatever the creation begins. I think that when you look at it from the perspective how I'm trying to describe it, the thought of doing something beforehand speaks of a plan that was no accident. People like to talk about the creation and make it sound like a convenient accident. There was no accident. And when we talk about moving through these prepositions as through him, all things through him. He became and was the agent. He was the instrument. In fact, I'll show you 10 possible uses. If you think that I'm making a fuss over one small preposition, here are 10 uses for this little preposition in. That's the workhorse of prepositions of the New Testament occurring, I think, 2,752 times. 
but you've got 10 different ways to interpret this little particle. Now, for somebody out there in TV land, they're going to say, well, isn't it all the same? You know, if your Bible reads by him or with him or for him, well, then you miss everything that I've just said. In other words, there was a plan. It was strategic. It wasn't an accident. And it certainly wasn't some, you know, people might say, well, could you translate this particle with instead of no? It's very specific. This is my frustration with Bible translators. For example, there are rules. I won't bore you with them, but there are rules. If you have a dative here that follows a personal preposition, it's because the verb sits here, which tells me this can only be in the dative. That dative brings me back to in him, not by him, for him. And you might say, well, aren't those words all the same? Get your dictionary out, even for you English grammarians, and you know what I'm saying. They carry and convey nuances of different meanings. This is abundantly clear. We're not playing footsie with the translation. So I love the fact that my text, 116, covers three dimensions of Christ's activity, from the thought process within him to what he brought forth traveling through him to what was done that was done for his purpose for himself. You walk away from this text with a little clearer picture that Christ is the creator. This is Paul's words, not mine. And then you start going through the Bible and confirming these concepts, and you'll find this is shored up over and over and over again. Now, just like the Holy Spirit, you remember in John's Gospel where Jesus says, it's important, it's expedient that I go away, otherwise the Comforter will not come. You see, the Holy Spirit has a particular work, and if you read that passage out of John, it says very clearly to bring the Scripture to mind, to help us to learn, to help us to grow, to bring conviction to our hearts, to open our eyes, to help with our understanding. The Father sent the Son. And I like to kind of do one thing when I say to you, when we refer to the Son, because some people get confused about the Father and the Son, the Son is referred to in the way, the Son, because of his incarnation, if you will, the fact that he took on the flesh. But now if I take all of the Godhead and put it back together, all involved in this activity but Christ, the agent of creation, not created. Christ, the, if you want to say, and we we may even say, the Father could have said, Son, let's picture the conversation. Son, we need to create this place to start our creative work. And maybe there was a discussion. I'm being silly right now. But then the Father could have easily said to the Son, Now, Son, Not yet, because he wasn't incarnate, but son, second person of the Godhead, you will be the agent through which this is carried out. And when you read the opening of Genesis, and it says the spirit of the deep hovered over the waters, you'll encounter the Trinity right there. I've taught you this before in the opening of Genesis, which has the majestic Hebrew plural, Elohim, which is a plural, which tells you right then and there It was not God singular, but God in the triune state in the creation. So there's nothing that I'm saying here that isn't confirmable, that we can't look at and say now, if God did all this, and Christ being the agent to bring this through, and we even see that what's mentioned here are seen and unseen. Seen, I see you, unseen. How about all the people who I can't see anymore? How about angelic beings, which quite often appeared in the Bible, which we don't see? You either believe in this or you don't. And you can't, don't go with, I only believe in good angels, please. Go take a bike ride somewhere. <laughs> if, you, if there's lightness, there's dark. If there's a sun, you can't have one and not the other. What he's saying is these, even these things created, he created them and he has power over them. Sometimes I think we forget, sometimes, Christianity is, at its core, a battle for the soul. Now, I can't tell you how to avoid the pitfalls of life. I can't tell you how to 
stay above water or whatever it is you need to do. But I can tell you one thing. Anyone who commits their heart and their mind to learning about God becomes a target, becomes an active target. In fact, the more your enthusiasm, I know I went through it and I've read hundreds if not thousands of letters from people who have taken the same path I have. It's not come to Jesus and everything gets great. It's come to Jesus and you're going to have a heck of a ride at the beginning because there's going to be trials, there's going to be tribulations, there's going to be temptations. Not all of them come from fallen or unseen. Some of them we know. I know people like to argue this point, but the Bible is abundantly clear when it says in Genesis 22, God tested, God tempted Abraham to see what was in his heart, whether he would or he wouldn't. I'm saying to you today, if anything resonated with you from this text, it should be this. He had a plan. He had a design. He had a blueprint. He is, as Hebrews 12 says, the architect of our faith, which means not only architect, but he did the whole job. He, he thought of it. He brought it to fruition with the master builder, work of his hands. And he did it and made it for himself, to him, which means everything that is contained, good, bad, and of course the ugly, belong to him. Now, for a Christian, that's super easy. You read the Bible and it says, you're not your own, you're bought with, bought with a price, and that price is Christ's blood. But how many people are still, as Christians, living in the I'm my own boss, and I'm the master of my destiny. Now, how can, you, how can you have that looking at this text when it says all things, which includes you and me, all things by his handiwork, all of creation praises him. We may not hear it. We may not see it. We may not understand it. So how could we not look at this text, not only to be certain that he's not created, but how could we not look at this text and recognize such a methodic plan included me. And such a methodic plan included you. Now, he doesn't say, I made the plan and you're never going to fail. He simply said, this is the plan. And see, maybe if you walk in it, you'll discover what it is. It's an incredible life of finding the very essence of what was lost coming to a place where, you know, I've met people and they're just bored silly. They listen to the Bible. Man, it, it's like melatonin. It puts them to sleep. They can't be, you, you can't interest them. You can't budge them one quarter turn from asking a question or even from finding them, reading the Bible at any time, except if they have to be in church. Versus those people that say, if this is all planned and I'm part of that plan and God called me out of among people, that he didn't call, which is how Ephesians opens in the Greek, then I can say today, grateful to God that he called me, and I'm not going to walk around thinking, what's my purpose, and how will I function, and what am I going to do? He's got a plan. And the first part of this plan is to be clear that he brought all this into being. The first part of this plan is to understand that all, we'll, we'll find in the second chapter, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells in Christ. So when we come to know Christ more, we come to know about the Godhead. And the more we know about the Godhead, the more we can grow in our relationship and understanding. And I'll, I'll say it in a way that is grammar-related. If Christ is in me and the Holy Spirit works through me, then I'm going to go back to that bottom one. It's for a purpose, and it's not for me. It's for him. You think about this. We have this short life we live here. If you make it to 90 or 100, lucky you, maybe or maybe not, depending on what's going on in society. But the fact of the matter is, that's pretty much the years allotted to humankind. So if you're not willing to believe in the plan, which includes eternity. You're losing out, friend. And if you only have, as Paul said, if you only have 
what you have in the now, we're pretty miserable and our faith is vain. What is it for? Well, when I look to that, I think to myself, no, it's even more abundantly clear. God has a plan. He already executed in creation. I'm standing before you. You know, if you said to me 30 years ago, do you know what God's plan is? I'd say, no, not at all. I have no clue. And it wouldn't have looked like this, trust me. But the fact of the matter is this was part of his plan. And all I had to do is exercise faith. All I had to do is trust him and take him at his word. Now, I believe every person in the sound of my voice today should take a fresh look and understand something. No accidents in God's book, no coincidences. Start walking according to his purpose and his plan. And that doesn't mean that you're not going to fall down and you're not going to slip and you're not going to have troubles and tribulations. Start walking according to his plan because his plan is better than any plan we could come up with. It's better than any government plan. It's better than any plan I could think of of any kind, which includes a life well living, lived here in the now with him, union with him now, and a life that I look forward to in eternity with him. That's part of his plan too. Let it sink in a little bit. We're not just here as happy accidents. We're all here for a purpose. And even the chaos in the world and the craziness that's going on and people talking about diseases and vaccines and what are we going to do, stick with your faith. God's got a plan. And follow that path when everything else is chaos. Remember, he's still the one that calms the storm. He created it. He's still the one that calms the storm and can guide you in the darkest and toughest hours. I pray you take that as comfort today. In Jesus' name, that's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.